Good morning, OBU. It's great to be here. Greetings from Tallahassee, Florida. My name's Dean, and it's been really an honor to be a part of this great university this week. I got here Sunday night, and I've really enjoyed spending time here. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 7 uh, to start, uh, verses 21 through 23. And what we're going to talk about today is what I call the mission field of unsaved Christians. That might sound a little bit strange to you. But we're going to talk about the mission field of unsaved Christians. We'll explain exactly what that is about. I always like to know who I'm speaking to first. So to get an idea of the crowd and just like who, who's in front of me. It's not just like a random guy coming to speak. I want to know who you are. Uh, how many of you are like me? How many of you went to public school? Can I get a woo or something? Okay, well, I, okay. I went to public school, went to Christian college. And when my roommate, my random roommate's parents found out I went to public school, they had a prayer request to their church that I didn't do drugs. <laughs> and they like laid hands on the door of our dorm room before I got there. How many of you went to Christian school? Where are you at? All right. Now y'all are the ones who got kicked out of public school for doing drugs, am I right? Now where are my homeschool kids at? Let's go, let's go. Y'all can be the ones that are doing drugs when you're 40. Just so everybody knows. It's good to meet you. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus just got through in verses 13 and 14 talking about the narrow gate and the wide gate. The narrow road and the broad road. That one leads to life and one leads to death. That one leads to light and one leads to darkness. Wide roads, narrow roads. Really some tough words from Jesus here, some warnings, some clear statements about who he is and the people's need to be on the narrow road that comes through Jesus, through his death, that leads us to life. But then what he does after that in the text has always been interesting to me. I actually believe, I'm not being dramatic when I say this, it's one of the most fascinating, really kind of twists of a storyline in all of the Bible. After he talks about a narrow road and a wide road, he doesn't go into some rant about atheism. He doesn't bring up other religions that existed at the time. He doesn't talk about the dangers of pagan worship at the temple. He doesn't talk about Greek gods. Here is what he says, from narrow road and wide road to verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. What is the will of our Father in heaven in this context? To believe the good news, to trust in Christ and his gospel. On that day, the day of judgment, many, remember wide road, narrow road, he said many are on the wide road. And here's that word again, he says many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? And Drive out demons in your name and do many miracles in your name. And then in verse 23, we see maybe some of the harshest words of Jesus in all the Bible. He says, then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. And they're like, lawbreakers? Didn't we just tell you all the things we've done? Didn't we just give you all of our religious accomplishments? Like how fascinating, the example he gives of a wide road and a narrow road are people who think they're on the right road but are actually on the wrong road. People who think they're on the narrow road, many of them, but are actually on the wide road that leads to destruction. I believe what we're talking about is the largest mission field in America today. That 2,000 years later, they might not say things like prophesy in your name and drive out demons. They might say things like, didn't I go to church? Didn't I fill in the blank of an answer that has actually nothing to do with the work of Jesus on your behalf? See, these people here, they were saying, didn't we do these things? Rather than saying, didn't he, didn't Christ do these things for us? So I want to go through this morning, or I believe are a few barriers to reaching unsaved Christians. People who think they are Christians and are not. Now, I don't think I'm the judge of who's a Christian and who's not, nor do I want to be. I don't think you are either, but the Bible is. The scriptures are. So I want to look at some barriers today, maybe to one, examine your own heart, but also for most of us here who probably are believers, to help us understand the context that many of us will find ourselves in today and your future work environments, whatever you might be. And as we go through this, you might think of your own family. 
You might think of your own friends, your own classmates, people back home, whatever it might be, people who claim to be Christians, but by that they simply just mean they think they're good people who believe in God. The first barrier is belief. Belief. Now that kind of sounds strange, because belief's actually a wonderful thing. Belief is actually a gift of God. It's God's grace that we can believe, had the gift of belief, the gift of faith in him. But so many people believe they're Christians simply because they believe in God. It's like, what do you mean? Why are you talking to me about God and about Christianity? It's not like I'm an atheist or anything. If you ask them why they're a Christian, the reason they give you is simply that they believe in God. But the book of James says this in chapter 2, that you believe that God is one good. Even the demons believe that and they shudder. And he's being sarcastic here. He's being snarky here. So you believe in God? Okay, congratulations, so does the devil. I'll even argue that the devil probably even has better beliefs than unsaved Christians do. So if anybody knows the gospel is true, it's the one that wants to lie and tell you the opposite. If anyone knows Jesus died on the cross and rose again, trust me, it's the devil. I would say he actually has a more accurate belief than many unsaved Christians about God. Because the God of unsaved Christians, of Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, modern day 2020 Christians, is what I just call a generic or vague theism. A generic or vague theism. Is it the God of the Bible? Is it the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Is it Yahweh? No, it's just a big guy in the sky. It's an imaginary friend, maybe a moral compass, maybe kind of a divine Santa Claus you know, a grandpa figure, something along those lines, and not actually the God of the Bible. Well, you might say, well, who are you to say that? Who are you to say the God they worship is not the God of the Bible? And that's a fair question, and I think we actually had the authority to say that because the God of the Scriptures is not vague. He is not generic. He has made himself known to us. In the book of Hebrews, we're told that long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways, but in these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son, The God has spoken, and the ultimate revelation of God is his son, Jesus Christ. He's not vague. He's not generic. He's not a big guy upstairs. He's a God who's made himself known. A.W. Tozer famously said, the most important question we can ask is, nope, sorry, Carl, Carl Henry said, the most important question we can ask is not, is there a God? But if there is a God, has he spoken? So if he hasn't spoken, we're not accountable to very much. But if he has spoken, we must pay careful attention to what it is that he has to say through the scriptures. And one of the first things he tells us is that he is the one true God, and this is who I am. And the rest of the scriptures are God revealing himself to us ultimately through Christ. Donald Whitney wrote this, that a man may pine for peace and have no interest in the Prince of Peace. Many who claim they are questing for God are not thirsting for God as he has revealed himself in scripture, but only for God as they want him to be, or a God that will give them what they want. Again, a God that we've invented, not the God of the Bible. Most of you do not know very many atheists. Statistically, yeah, it's growing, but it's nowhere near the dominant population, not just of Oklahoma, but of America. Most people don't know a lot of atheists. Most people, I'm talking like professing like I'm an atheist kind of atheist. Most people don't know a lot of Muslims. Most people, I'm guessing in this room, don't know a lot of Jews, maybe one or two families at your high school. Most of you don't know a lot of Buddhists or a lot of Hindus, like personally, but you know lots of people who would claim they're Christians, and by that they simply mean they're not atheists, they're not Jewish, they're not Muslim. And why it's been hard to detect for so long, we've been frustrated with cultural Christianity thinking it's a discipleship, or that it's, that it's a discipleship issue. And these folks just need to get their act together, get more serious about their faith. You know, they need to just you know, repent of their sins and go all in for Jesus. And I would argue that's not the issue. The issue is it's an evangelism issue. These people aren't Christians. Why should you act like a Christian and be serious about Christ when you don't know him? And why it's hard to detect is you fill out an application or a, a job application or some kind of survey, and they say things like, give us your race, your gender, your height, your weight, your address, your social. Then they say, indicate your religion. Well, you go down the form, and the first one says, no religion. You're like, well, I'm not no religion. I'm not that. Jewish, I, I know I'm not that. Buddhist, I, I know I'm not that. Muslim, no. Hindu, I don't even know what that is. I'm not that. And you just kind of keep going down the line, and then it says Christian. 
and you check the box because you're not the other things on the list. There's not a box that says, thinks you're a Christian, but you're not. <laughs> and that's why it's gotten so confusing for a lot of us is that people think they're Christians basically because they're not other things. Don't let belief be the barrier. Something as precious and beautiful as belief be the barrier to actually knowing the good news of Jesus Christ and having gospel conversations with your friends. The second thing is morals. Another great thing. Morals are also a gift from God. It's really hard to reach someone for Christ who thinks they're a good person and that they're actually fine. It's a lot easier to reach someone for Christ who knows they're bottomed out, who knows they've messed up, who knows they've made mistakes. And here's what's complicated about trying to reach the good person. They're actually right. They are really good moral people by American standards in 2020 of what it means to be good. So the next thing complicated is we have to help them see they're actually making the wrong comparison. I call it changing the comparison game. Because when I compare myself to other people, hopefully I can find somebody a little worse than me. Hopefully. Or if not, I, I just don't need to compare, just make sure that I'm up to speed with whatever morals look like on campus in Shawnee, Oklahoma in 2020. As long as I'm on pace with that, I can feel good uh, that I'm a good person. But we've got to change the comparison game because when I compare myself to God rather than someone else, guess what? I fall short every single time and become aware of my need for his forgiveness because I've sinned against him. Here's a story Jesus tells in Luke chapter 18. He says, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, who was the religious of the religious, the moral of the moral, and the other a tax collector, who in this time period in the first century would have been viewed as kind of the ultimate sinner. And now for me, as an adult who has a full-time job uh, with tax uh, season approaching, about to pay my taxes, I now think once again that they are great sinners. Uh, that's just a side note. Uh, verse 11, the Pharisee was standing and praying like this about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. So he makes a general comparison to the culture at large. Then he gets specific. He goes, you know, I'm not greedy or, or unrighteous or adulterers. Then he makes a personal comparison. I have someone that's worse than me. Or that I'm even like this tax collector. And then he gives his resume. Remember Matthew 7? Didn't I prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, perform miracles in your name? Here's what he says. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. Let me see a break here, a contrast. He says, but, but the tax collector, standing far off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. In other words, God, everything the Pharisee just said about me is true. So I'm not going to present to you my moral accomplishments or my resume. I'm not going to say, didn't I do all of these things? Instead, here's what I'm going to say. God, have mercy on me. I can't stand before you on my best day, not because I'm a tax collector, but because I've sinned before a holy God. And you, a holy God, will not let sin go unpunished. So God, have mercy on me. And the good news is that Jesus answered his prayer and continues to answer our prayer today when we cry out with that. I tell you, he says, this one went down to his house justified, as in not guilty, made right with God, rather than, he says, this one, not that one, rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Conversion is the crying need of the soul to be reconciled to God, and the only way that's possible is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Faith and repentance, believing the good news of Jesus and what he's done for us. Paul wrote this to the Galatian church. He said, I don't set aside the grace of God for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. You ever notice that one of the most common beliefs in America today is that good people go to heaven? You ever notice that? Every funeral I've ever been to, that I've just attended and not been the officiant, every single one, the officiant will always say, we're just so thankful that he's in a better, he's in a better place. And somebody from the family will share a story. We're just so glad that grandma and grandpa are reunited again. She missed him so much. 
Or we're just so glad that Uncle Bill's fishing in the big bass lake in the sky. You know, those type of things. And their reason for believing that, and again, I don't think we stand up there and go, no, he's not, he's burning. I'm not saying do that, okay? I'm not saying that. But their reason for believing that is simply because he's a great guy. He's an awesome grandpa, he's a great friend, a great uncle, a great dad. Those are their reasons. I did a funeral not too long ago of a guy who died at 19 years old, so you can just imagine how horrible it was, just very tragic death, a believer, thankfully a Christian. And his parents are very clear to me, we want you to be really, you know, as clear as you can be about the gospel. I said, absolutely. So I was the last person to go. And they had like six people share, like friends, family, and everyone talked about how amazing this guy was. And they're right, he was a great guy. They're like, he was the best brother, he was the best friend, lit up a room when he walked in, salt of the earth, would trust him with anything. And they're all right and they're all chose great. So it came time for me to share at the very end. I was the closer, Mariana Rivera. I was the closer coming in from the pen. And I got up there and I said, I want to first thank the family. I know it was very difficult to share the thoughts that you shared. I said, I think those things are fantastic and I want everyone to know in this room that everything this family just said about Heath is 100% true. But not one of those reasons are why he is in heaven today. He's in heaven today because Jesus Christ died in his place for his sin, took on a penalty of death that he deserved, make him right with God, and then rose from the grave three days later. That is why he's in heaven today, and he believed that in faith and repentance. Don't let morals be the thing that confuses us. It's so easy to go down that road. The third thing is heritage. Another wonderful thing. Basically kind of rites of passage, where people believe they're Christian simply because they'll point to their family. Are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, we come from a Christian family. My, my grandfather, my dad's side of the family is very, very Catholic. And uh, my grandpa, he's been probably gone for about 10 years. He's 89 years old. Went to Mass all the time, all that stuff. And we're sitting down one day. We're watching a football game, Notre Dame, of course. And in the conversation, he asked me, he said, Can I, I'm already, already a pastor by now, already pastor in the church I pastor. He goes, Dean, I have a question. I said, what's up, Pops? That's what I called him. I wasn't like trying to be like cool, like, what's up, Pops? So I called him Pops, okay. So I said, you're like, wow. Um, so I said, um, he said, why aren't you Catholic? And I said, what do you mean? I, mean, I knew what he meant, but I was trying to go like, where are you going with this? Because I just don't understand why you're not Catholic. We've never had this conversation before. And I wasn't going to go into like this, you know, three-hour dissertation on the Reformation with my grandfather. <laughs> so I just gave him a couple of basic answers of why I wasn't Catholic. And he goes, I just don't understand. He's like, your dad's Catholic. I was like, Pops, no, he's not. Like, he's in the next room. You can go ask him. Yes, he is. I was like, no, he's not. He's a member of our church. <laughs> like, he's, he's not. He's a deacon. That'd be real bad, right? I mean, like, we've got a lot of things going on. He goes, well, your Uncle Tim's Catholic, his other son. I was like, Pops, he's an atheist. He has a Darwin fish on the back of his car. He's like an angry atheist. Like, you can call him right now. No, he's not. He's Catholic. I was like, Pop, he's an atheist. Not like I'm a confused, like he, he like reads Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchin books. Well, your Uncle Ted, his youngest son, he's Catholic. He's nothing. He'll tell you he's nothing. He's an agnostic. Well, whatever. No, they're not. They're Catholic. All right. It was as frustrating as it sounds. I learned something that day. For my grandpa, being Catholic was more important than believing Catholic. And that's not a knock on the Catholic Church. It's no different in Protestant life. It just looks a little bit different. It doesn't come with First Communion and those type of things. Instead, it just means that like you went to church when you were a kid, got baptized when you were six, went to Awanas, whatever it might have been, or you, so you point to these rites of passage rather than pointing to Christ for why you are a Christian. And in your family heritage, simply being Christian is more important than actually believing Christian. And I want to tell you, that is on the wide road that leads to destruction. If your answer to why you're a Christian is anything other than the work of Jesus on your behalf, then you might not be. I heard old Southern Baptist preacher used to say that God doesn't have grandchildren, and that is so true. Those who believe in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. You become a child of God through adoption, not through heritage. Now, thank God for Christian heritage. Praise God for that. 
for godly grandparents and godly great parents and people who made you go to church. Praise God for that. Can faith be passed down? Absolutely. Can faith be inherited? Absolutely not. Passed down? Yes. If anybody had a right to claim heritage, it was James. He was the brother of Jesus. Could you imagine being the brother of Jesus? I know, Mom, he always makes his bed, right? I mean, could you imagine how frustrating that would be? He could have claimed it, but instead, you know what he did? He gave his life as a martyr. The same James that wrote, you believe there's one God, good, so does the devil? He gave his life as a martyr. Not because he saw his brother never say no to sharing his toys, but because he saw his brother die and rise from the grave. I'm not a Christian by heritage, I'm a Christian by conviction because of who he is and what he has done. I um, am from Fort Lauderdale originally, and it's a geography or a culture lesson. South Florida is much more like New York than it is like the South. Even though it's like the South, the most Southern point there is, there's no Southern culture whatsoever. Because everybody's from the North and moved down there. Where I'm from in Tallahassee, where I moved to in Tallahassee, where I live now, is 10 miles from the Georgia line. I mean, it's sweet tea, people back their pickup trucks into parking spots. It is Southern, okay? I mean, it's like country music, like it is barbecue, it, it is Southern. So we moved from Fort Lauderdale to Tallahassee. I met a friend and owner of his house to play after school like you would when you're in fourth grade or whatever. And after doing that a few times, his mom told him he wasn't allowed to play with me anymore because I was rude. So she informed me of that. And I went home and like cried to my mom. And she's like, what did you do? <laughs> I, was like, I was like, well, I didn't do anything. I said, please and thank you. And I, I was, I, I don't know. And I was crying and I don't understand why Mrs. Morris won't let me play with her son anymore because she thinks I'm rude and disrespectful. So my mom does what any mom would do in that moment. And she called her. She's like, what did he do? Like what happened that made you not let him not play with him anymore? You know what it was? I didn't say yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Or no, or, or no ma'am, yes sir. I didn't respond with answers to questions by sir or ma'am. I would just say things like yes please, no thank you, rather than saying no sir or yes sir. And in the South, that's considered extremely rude because everyone in the South responds to every question, if you're a kid, you're an adult, by yes ma'am and yes sir. So where I come from in South Florida, no one says that. Like, they think that like, you're being rude and calling them old if you say yes ma'am and yes sir. Well, you just declared them like going on the gospel cruise and then going to Branson, Missouri and eating at Shoney's at 5 p.m. I mean, that's what they think you're doing. Okay, but that's, that's what they think. So guess what I started doing immediately? I started saying, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, and no, sir. I had zero conviction that that was polite. Where I come from, you just say please and thank you. But in Tallahassee, to be considered polite, you say ma'am and sir. So I just started saying what I was supposed to say. With zero conviction outside of this is just what you do. For a lot of people in cultural Christianity, claiming you're a Christian has nothing to do with any gospel conviction whatsoever besides admiring Jesus and thinking he's a nice guy and having a generic theism, but it's just what you do. If your answer to why you are a Christian is not by conviction but rather than by culture, you might not be one. And the last one's ignorance. Just ignorance. A lot of people just don't know. They think they're Christians and no one's ever actually told them the gospel. That's my story. I was raised mainline Protestant. And there are some remnant, faithful, mainline Protestant churches out there, thankfully. Not that many anymore, sadly. But there are still some remnant ones. I want to be fair there and respectful there. Uh, my church was not one of those. Very nice people. Treated me very well. Taught me great morals. But no one ever told me I needed to be saved. That I was a sinner and needed a savior. I went to a Fellowship of Christian Athletes retreat when I was 13 years old and heard the gospel for the first time. And I joke, but I'm, well, it's serious, that I'm, I think I'm the first person to ever come to Christ and be angry about it. And I had some joy, don't get me wrong, but at 13 years old, I'm sitting there thinking in my head, how has no one ever told me this before? Like, how have I never heard this before? And the preacher that day, he preached on Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. He said, a lot of y'all think you're Christians and you're not because your reason you think you're a Christian is because you're a good person and believe in this generic God and come from a Christian family. And my Christian family, just meant we prayed before dinner, went to our little Methodist church, and we're good people. 
We had a manger scene, nativity scene at Christmas time on our mantle, but I couldn't tell you anything about that baby in the manger. Outside, he was a great moral teacher. I knew some of the stories of the Bible, but none of them had to do with saving my soul. So I went forward and put my, and gave my life to Christ. I came home, again, 13, immature, overzealous. I walk in the door, and I'm like, I bust open the door. My parents are like, hey, and I'm like, our church is terrible. And they were like, whoa, Tiger, ease up, you know, kind of thing. Like, whoa. My parents thought I joined a cult. <laughs> you know why they thought that? Because cultural Christians only think the difference between themselves and like an actual Christian is just that the actual Christians are really into it. They don't think that you're a Christian and they're not. They just think that the actual Christians are just really, really, and they think you're weird. Thankfully, since then, my entire family has come to know the Lord. My entire family is following Jesus. We've all come to faith and baptized. But we were going to church every, we never miss church, never, unless we were sick or out of town. But people getting in the car, going to church on Sunday morning, wearing our Sunday best, having no idea about the Jesus who died on the cross that was one of the decorations inside the church. Here's my challenge to y'all. Reprogram your mind to think about what is possibly the biggest evangelistic mission field in our area. A lot, most evangelism strategies that have been given to us over the years are only designed to reach skeptics and strangers. That kind of, I'm thankful for any kind of method. Let's go reach people for Christ, period, so I'm not making fun of that. When was the last time we were actually taught how to reach our friends? Because most of our friends aren't skeptics. I guarantee you, as I talked today, you had some, a family member pop in your mind, you had a friend pop in your mind, a neighbor pop in your mind, someone from high school back home pop in your mind. And we have to be really clear about what is a Christian and what is not. And we're not saying be more like me. That's not what we're saying. Not I'm the model Christian. You're not Christian enough. We're saying many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name and perform miracles in your name and cast out demons in your name? And I'll tell them, away from me, you workers of lawlessness, I never knew you. There's a wide road and a narrow road, and many are on the wide road, and what does he use as his example? Not atheism, not pagan temple worship, not Greek gods, but people who think they're on the right road and actually are on the wrong road. What if more than trying to make people always feel like that they are assured of their salvation, we actually made sure they had it in the first place? I'm a big believer in assurance, trust me. Huge believer in the doctrine of assurance. Massive believer in it. I feel like sometimes, especially in my tradition in Baptist life, we're more into making sure someone thinks they're a Christian than actually making sure they are. We can be both and, okay? That's what we have to do together if we're going to be faithful witnesses. I'm going to pray for us because y'all got to go to class in the rain, so have fun with that. <laughs> hey, thanks for letting me be here. I really enjoyed being with you guys. I love this school. Great folks, great people. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for tough words from Jesus because we know you love us enough that you want us to be warned and want us to know and want us to be sure. So I ask when we see uh, those warnings in the Bible, we'll see them as words of love, as one who has compassion for people and wants us to know the good news. So I thank you that at that FCA camp a long time ago that the gospel was made clear to me, and I ask that forever on that my salvation will be understood in the eternal security and assurance I have in the work of Christ for me, something I can never do on my own, something I can never accomplish the forgiveness of sins and reconciliation to you. So pray for these students here, that they'll be bold, that they'll be clear, that they'll uh, be self-aware about their faith and about what it stands on, and they'll be people who are first and foremost about the gospel of Jesus Christ and about your mission. I ask you bless them the rest of the semester in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks, guys.